Pacheco, board certified dentist who is highly regarded for her aesthetic workmanship. Dr. Kalashe has been ranked top doc in Orange County Magazine, also Modern Luxury Magazine there in Los Angeles. She holds a solid five-star rating on several platforms for her quality of practice, exceptional care and skill. She is also a member of the American Academy of General Dentistry and the American Academy of Facial Aesthetics. Welcome, Dr. Kalasho. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and next to you, Dr. Zumalan. Dr. Zumalan is a board-certified oculoplastic surgeon who practices in Beverly Hills. Dr. Zumalan is a prolific researcher, having published over 70 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters and continues to teach as an adjunct clinical professor at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Dr. Zumalan is also the founder of Skinuva, a physician designed and clinically tested skincare product for scars and hyperpigmentation. Welcome, Dr. Zumalan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, said he has such great taste. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and start out with you, Dr. Kalashe, with our questions. What should someone know about in-office teeth whitening if they're scared of tooth damage? So yeah, we get that question a lot, especially because we live in Los Angeles. And I mean, in this state, in this life, everybody wants to have that perfect white smile. Um, when we do bleaching in office, uh, we, you have to understand that we do use heavy chemicals like primarily hydrogen peroxide. Um, at a high concentration, usually over about 30%. At that concentration, it can cause gum irritation. It can also make your enamel potentially thin. So what I do recommend is people who are afraid of the damage to the teeth, that they do so, when they whiten their teeth, they don't do it like once every week. There are some, there, this kind of stuff has to be done in moderation. So I'd recommend maybe doing a professional whitening once a year. And then uh, when you do a professional whitening, because you're using such high intensity uh, peroxides, you wanna make sure that you're being seen by a professional because the professional is gonna be able to cover your gums so that they don't get chemical burn from the peroxide. Uh, we also use in our office uh, a, a, a mineralization paste that we use afterwards so that you make sure that the, that the enamel stays strong, stays healthy. Um, we also put you on a regimen afterwards that includes all the, the products that you can get over the counter that are really good at keeping your teeth nice and white and healthy. Um, we also really push that you come in for regular dental cleanings to maintain that whiteness and that, and that, uh, you know, that brightness in, in, in teeth color that's actually healthy. So I, 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 I completely get when people say, is it something that can damage the teeth? I mean, there are studies out there that say that it absolutely can, but there's a lot of products out there that, that certainly are abrasive to enamel because a man, uh, enamel at a microscopic level is just some, uh, a crystalline structure. So it can dehydrate, it can break down. Um, so I want to put out there that, you, that it's safe to do professional whitening, but don't do it like every every month. There are some people who really want to come in every month to get a whitening. Just do it once a year and, and in between your whitening sessions, maybe do like press white strips or get the right uh, home care. And you can go on my Instagram and I give a lot of um, home remedies as well as products that I recommend to keep your teeth nice and white. Yeah, I, I make him do it. Don't drink coffee or <laughs> red wine after you get your teeth whitened. Yeah, I whiten doctor. his teeth and then I tell him don't why don't drink coffee for for two days afterwards, and then I see him with a Starbucks cup in his hand. <laughs> I have a quick question for you. What about utilizing a straw if you're going to have a dark purple, like coffee or red wine, et cetera, et cetera? I, red wine with a straw is kind of a bummer, but uh, yeah. I definitely def drink my coffee either through a sippy cup. You know, like even when you when you go to Starbucks and you get the, the lid on there. If you're not drinking it directly out of a cup, it won't give so much of a, of a of like a, a just a swish through and goes through all your teeth. If you could just use a straw or use a sippy cup, um, or use a what's what's it called? The cap? Not a sippy yeah. cup. That's for kids. The cap. That the cap. Yeah. <laughs> you know that's what I mean. Right. But yeah, uh -huh. use use that so that you're not actually just drinking out of a cup because that can really uh, actually can stain the fronts of your teeth, especially those lower teeth. Um, you do have a salivary gland back there that so it kind of piles up a lot of plaque, plaque plaque down there so some people will say i always 
fresh and floss, but I noticed that my lower teeth always get so much buildup. That buildup is coming from primarily because food can get trapped down there too. Also, there's a salivary gland that's right behind the lower teeth. Um, if you have plaque on your teeth, your teeth get stained faster. So if, if usually if you're, if you're not keeping up with after you're uh, drinking coffee or drinking wine, not brushing immediately after or at least rinsing with water immediately after, then you can have a, a more inclination of having that stain actually stick onto the teeth. Thank you, Dr. Colasso. And real quick too, for an in-home treatment in between, you know, annual teeth whitening there at your office, what would you recommend? We've heard so many people say Crest White Strips. Are you in I concurrence with that? White Strips. I actually, um, I think, especially after a professional whitening, because after a professional whitening, you can get to like two to three times, if, if not four times as, as uh, in change of shade as your original. So you get a really, really intense white, but you can't really get that with the at-home products because their concentration is lower. So what I would recommend is using the lower-ended products like the over-the-counter stuff like Crest White Strips, um, maybe even like uh, Opalescence um, toothpaste and mouth rinses like Act has a really good whitening toothpaste, uh, uh, mouth rinse actually that's out there. I like it because it's colorless mouth rinse. Um, you can use a lot of those that stuff after a professional whitening. I love Crest White Strips; are really good. Um, I also use like Opal. What's the hell it's called? It's by Colgate. It's like a little, um, like it looks like a little wand, like a pen. You can kind of brush it on your teeth. Um, I use so many products. Again, my Instagram usually I just drop hints on stuff that I like to use. But there are so many great products out there. But if you want a really big, intense change of your color, you probably want to do a professional whitening. And then in between, uh, get the right stuff. Thank you, Dr. Kalasho. How often do I use a strip? Help, yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, no, I'm just kidding. So, yeah, I know. <laughs> so like if I'm going out, we have, which we haven't had dinner dates in a long time, which I'm sad about, but we have them at home. We have them at home, but She's I'm an amazing cook. You guys, if you want to know about her talents, cooking amazing, by the way. After a while, it just gets taken out of way. Yeah. But, but, um, <laughs> But uh, so what I do, like we're going out or we have a party coming up. I kind of, while I'm getting ready, I put a Crest White Strip on. And then you'll notice that if you are a person who kind of keeps up with their hygiene well and, uh, you know, whitens professionally every so often, that that even that one strip of whitening, uh, that Crest White Strip actually makes a difference. It brings back your original, the, the shade that you had after your professional whitening. So I kind of do it for like a half an hour. I'll put it on while I'm getting ready and everything and then take it off. I did do it right before. <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 I tell you, I, she makes me, uh, you know, not she makes, but she's advised me. As, I do make him. <laughs> brushing my teeth, <laughs> my teeth and I water pick for the last year and a half. So how um, good does it feel? It's incredible. I mean, okay. I, a water pick is amazing for making sure that you remove that like well, or pre preventing that in-between stain. A lot of people say like, okay, I whiten my teeth, but I get these like brown stains in between my teeth and it doesn't really come off. And then I always, I see them like buying little sandpaper and trying to wipe it. Probably don't want to do, yeah, that. Don't do that. <laughs> but yeah. if you go to your dentist, get it removed. And then in between to minimize the chances of getting those, get a water pick. My, my little trick of the trade is putting some, some whitening mouth rinse yes. inside of the tank Amazing. and just shoot it in between your teeth. And it's less likely that you'll get some of those. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it definitely has helped me in my routine. I feel like my teeth are cleaner, but at the end of the day, like I still need to see her every three months. It's, it's not a plug. Oh, you need to go see your dentist every three months, but I see it. I still get the stain oh, yeah. despite doing all There's these. There's a lot regimens. of gunk in there. I still get staining. <laughs> I still get plaque buildup, even though I'm going above and beyond what most people do. So it's so yeah. important to have a good dentist in your life that you're not scared of going to. Do you know dentist. one? Do yeah. you have one? Yeah, right here. She's amazing. And, <laughs> and she's got a gentle touch. And that's the thing. It's very, you know, people are very sensitive to their teeth that when they, you know, I grew up, you know, I, I had great dentists growing up and nowhere near Ooh. my wife. Uh, what I'm saying is the, <laughs> the, 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 the experience is so key when you visit just a doctor, especially a dentist that you feel comfortable and that you know you're in good hands. You're going to be as pain-free as possible during a dental procedure. People are scared of that. They're, yeah. they're more scared of dental procedures than they are of plastic surgery, honestly. Oh, yeah. My patients, well, they'll they'll go through an eyelid surgery in the uh -huh. office, but will not have a dental procedure while they're awake. It's it's just yeah, the I mean, way it it's is. It's such a delicate spot. So, to, 
Yeah. So you got to you know, trust the dentist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thankfully we have Rhonda here and, and she's done wonders to yeah, me. Yeah, don't be scared. We are, and, we are a bunch of like, we're, a, we're an all female office. Um, so I don't know if that maybe plays, but we, we have like a motherly kind of uh, yeah, relationship sure. with our patients that even yeah. if they feel a little bit of discomfort, you just have a bunch of women over your head making sure why yeah. you're, you know, how we can make you feel better. So you want to go to a dentist that makes you feel good, makes you feel comfortable. Um, there's a, really dentistry should not be painful. It's 2020. So, I mean, there's yeah. so much stuff out there. You don't need, it doesn't need to be painful at all. So um, just, so if you are having painful dental treatment, someone else. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Thank you both. Lots of great tips. Dr. Zumalan, this question is directed to you. What is the natural looking blepharoplasty procedure and how did you develop your unique approach? Great. So blepharoplasty is a mouthful and it's a Latin word for a procedure we perform as plastic surgeons that specialize around the eyes and it's removing uh, under eye bags or removing fat pockets. And that's something that most of us get throughout our lifetime, whether it's in your 20s, 30s, or 60s and decades of life. And generally, this procedure has been around for, I'd say, about nearly over, over 100 years, uh, more refined as the decades have gone by. And we found out that traditional blepharoplasty, which was where the fat was actually removed just with a skin incision from the outside, although that's still done in cases where there's significant extra skin, it's, that approach has become less and less common. And so when I trained in New York uh, nearly 15 years ago, uh, let me take this poll out. Uh, when I trained in New York, uh, we really focused on this advanced technique where we actually were able to uh, perform the procedure through a, 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 a scar or incision that was not visible. It was done behind the eyelid. And so that, that approach has become more favorable. And so through my years of training, I developed my own ways of doing a minimally invasive approach, even more so. We're minimizing use of heating devices, minimizing the use of sharp instruments, doing everything in a very gentle technique to allow for that fat to be visible. And then instead of just completely removing the fat, I uh, delicately redrape that fat to also address the volume loss that people have at the same time when they're undergoing eyelid surgery and with aging. So most of us end up having, uh, in addition to this prominent fat below their eyelids, which a blepharoplasty helps with, but they also, or we also undergo volume loss, meaning hollowing. And so you get this hollowing at the same time below that fat. So you get this double problem where you have this bulge and then you have this hollowing. And so this procedure that I and I'm not the only one that does this procedure. It's, it's essentially fat redraping, but the way I do it in my unique techniques kind of compromise what I call a natural looking blepharoplasty. The ultimate result is that I address the extra fat prob problem. I address the hollowing problem, <laughs> minimizing uh, the risks of complications that can happen from directly removing skin. So I don't remove skin in many cases, but I actually do it through a laser or a chemical peel, or even microneedling on the skin to help tighten the skin without directly cutting it. And that allows for our patients to have a, a dramatically easy recovery process. They get to go home. They don't really have a lot of pain issues. They can usually go back to work in a week. They'll have some soreness for the first day or so during the recovery process. But that's what makes my procedure unique. And I love doing it because you get to see the patients in a week and they already look tremendously amazing. And the swelling obviously will get better with time. It's not like in a week they're going to look perfect. They're going to look better. But the bruising and swelling will get better week to week. And I'd say majority of it gets better after two weeks. We right. share a lot of the same patients too. So I've seen a lot of them uh, not too long after the procedure. And they have minimal swelling. Uh, scars are, are nice and clean. It looks super natural. Uppers. Yeah, the uppers too. So yeah. uh, lower natural looking blepharoplasty is mainly for the lowers. I guess. So uppers you got to remove the skin and there's a small incision. Oh, technical yeah. difficulty. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so, Babe, I'm, I'm concentrating on the mouth. No, you're good. She's good, though. So, but thank Real you. quick to each of you, just I have a little bit of feedback here. Can you each speak louder? I think some of our viewers are having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Yes, We're how's gonna this? get really close. Is this better? Much better, and try to speak wow. a little, right, a little more loudly. Oh, wait, let me push the table 
Hold on, guys. We're going to push the table in a little bit. Babe, let, let, me, let me do it. Hold on one second. Oh, <laughs> oh man. She thinks she, she's so strong. I'm going to hurt her back one day. Okay, that's good. All right. Is that better? Is the volume good right now? Yeah, much better. We just, everyone wants to hear you both. So. Sorry about that, guys. Hopefully can you hear able... us? Try to speak as loudly as you can just so everyone can hear you very clearly. Yeah, I think you're going to be Where fine now. Where's your mic on this thing? Uh, I think it's right there. Oh. How's this, April? Better? Much better. I feel like right. I'm right against the... <laughs> we, have, we have our computer here, so we got to speak directly. Can we all, everyone wants to be able to hear you, so it's going to work. Okay. Over to you, Dr. Kalasho. How many times per year would you recommend teeth cleanings? Uh, okay, so a te when people say you should get a teeth cleaning uh, twice a year. That is generally for patients who have amazing oral hygiene. Like they take really good care of their teeth at home and they're flossing and they're water flossing and they're doing it multiple times a day. Uh, those patients, they're good to see their dentist twice a year. Um, once a year is really low. So even patients that have amazing oral hygiene, when they come once, you can see that they, that, that plaque that I was talking about before that really gets caked onto the teeth become hard and they become hard from the back, from essentially the stuff that's in your saliva will harden it onto the tooth. And if it's hard onto the tooth, what ends up happening is that tissue and bone can adhere to the tooth if there is something called tartar or plaque adhering to your, to maybe the gum line. Then you'll have recession. Then you could potentially have sensitivity um, to either hot and cold or even to brushing, then you'll have bleeding gums. You know, that, that kind of plaque really builds up quickly and hardens onto the teeth really fast. So you don't want that. You want, you want to come into the dental office when you have soft plaque, not hard on plaque. Soft plaque is much easier to remove. Um, so I definitely recommend twice a year for most people, but there are some people who are fighting gum disease. And gum disease can be gingivitis or it can be periodontitis, um, one being uh, one that has its effect on gums and periodontitis being one that affects bone and tissue. So those patients who have periodontal disease, for instance, uh, will lose bone. So as you're, so you're looking at yourself and you're brushing and you're seeing that, that, that those, those bloody gums or those irritated gums, even when you're flossing. That's your body having an inflammatory response to bacteria that it otherwise doesn't see as being communal. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's sending essentially a signal that there's something going on. There's a bacterial infection. And all those inflammatory cells are reacting to that. Now, in the process of doing that, it's degrading bone. It's actually breaking down bone. And the only thing that holds your teeth to your head is bone. So you want to make sure that you don't develop gingivitis or its advanced state, which is periodontitis. So a good way of making sure that doesn't happen is visit your dentist at least twice a year. And if you are a patient that has gingivitis or, or periodontitis, you want to do it a little bit more, like maybe three or four times a year. Um, that seems a lot like a lot. But what's great about it is patients who do that, who come at least three or four times a year, we find that their gum disease regresses. So it actually gets better. Um, it's, the, it's the most common disease known to humans, but the most treatable. So uh, just making sure that you just follow your hygienist. In our office, we have registered dental hygienists. They're, they're the gum gurus. Uh, they, they take care of their patients. They give the patient regimen, uh, their, their oral hygiene regimens for home care. And they put the patient on um, a, a recommended recall schedule, meaning do you come every three months, do you come every four months, or do you come every six months? It depends on you. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. Definitely go to your dentist first, see what's kind of going on. And if you need a little bit more, you know, leaven of the gums, uh, see it, we'll probably see you a little more. Um, but for the most part, maybe twice a year. Thank you, Dr. Colasso. Very thorough. I make you come because I have to, I have to smell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Dr. Zumalan. What do you recommend for an at-home treatment for a sty in the eye? At-home treatment for a sty in the eye. Well, sty is a blocked oil gland. It's like a pimple on the eyelid. And so the number one thing that we recommend is heat. Heat therapy, warm compresses. That helps break up the oil gland. And if it's, it can be painful, it cannot be painful. But ultimately, the heat therapy really helps quiet it down. 
sometimes that by itself, but most of the time that kind of, if you get it immediately, can actually break up that oil gland immediately. And so you don't have to seek care because it resolves by itself. But if it tends to be persistent, annoying, troublesome, you can see your eye doctor, ophthalmologist or oculoplastic surgeon like myself, and we can take a look at it. We may inject it with a steroid to break it up even more so. Or if it's really hard and nodular, then we may just make a small little cut and take it out from the inside, which I've had one in medical school. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was fine, went away with the treatment. So. It's so funny when he talks about eye surgery, I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I talk about deep surgery, he also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Zumalan. Dr. Kalasha, over to you. Do mouth washes have to burn in order to work effectively? No. No. I Don't. can say no. I tried that. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Okay, so usually the mouth rinses that burn have a lot of alcohol in it. And yeah. alcohol dehydrates the mouth. Uh, it's really not indicated to have any... There are other products out there that do not do that to your mouth that actually are more effective at reducing the amount of plaque in your mouth, bite gum disease, and bite cavities. So a couple of a couple of the products I like actually, I really love Act mouth rinses. The 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 more the newer one is clear. And my problem before with Act mouth rinse was that it was colored like green or blue. And I'm also really obsessed about having you know bright white teeth. So though you'll notice if you use like a lot of colored. Uh, mouth rinses after a while your teeth look like they are turning a little bit of, of a different color um i like this the new one by act uh it's clear um and i'm not paid by them so <laughs> i would like to be but you know so the so act mouth restore the clear one's really good it's the whitening one i love that one um i also really love crest products there is one by it's called gum care by crest that's a really good one. It has settled pretty bright in it, which is a which is a product that actually acts like a, essentially a, an antibacterial mouth rinse that we prescribe to patients called chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is a very very intense uh, chemical that it, that at a lower concentration, when used as a mouth rinse, can reduce uh, a patient's gum disease can also regress a patient uh, to, to relapse a patient's gum disease or regress back a patient's gum disease. Um, now it's a great product, chlorhexidine. We will use it intermittently for patients, but it makes your teeth blue. So if you use it for too much, it's, it, it's, it's really, yeah, it's a really strong uh, mouth rinse that can discolor your teeth. So Cetylperidium chloride is another product um, that doesn't do the discoloration to the teeth, but has its efficacy being comparable or comparable to uh, chlorhexidine. So that's in products like Crest. So Crest has a good uh, mouth rinse called Crest Gum Care. None that's a good though. one. And none of them burn. None of them burn. You can kind of just walk around. I walk around the room. That mean? spitting everywhere and like just kind of doing my thing like and, and rinsing and make sure you keep it in your mouth for a good amount of time like 30 to 40 seconds is a good amount of time and a good and, and a good suggestion to you is don't rinse your mouth after it's a habit for a lot of people to rinse uh, to to mouth rinse and then afterwards you just swish some water in there um you definitely want to let that product kind of sit and, and do its thing so spit it out and just don't eat or drink for half an hour and then also don't rinse with water after thank you dr kalasho and we show you dr zumalan this is from crime by design tell us about skinuva and skinuva bright all right well that that's a little off topic from me uh, in my practice in as a as an oculoplastic surgeon but but one of my passions is research and product development and kind of when I uh, thinking outside the box and as a plastic surgeon, I, I create incisions, I create scars and those scars are the lasting memories of patients that have undergone a procedure. And so we often prescribe a scar cream to help improve the scar as they, as it heals. And when I was in my few, first few years of training, I was buying a scar cream. It worked. It was just made of one material like silicone by itself. And it was, it was quite hefty of a price, and I was wondering why. Why you know, I can probably why can't we make something better? You know, there's a lack of advancements, and in my opinion, I think there's so many more ingredients that can actually help improve a scar in addition to silicone cream. And I started researching these ingredients and took a poll of like 30 ingredients and started narrowing it down. 
like a mad scientist in my, literally in, in, in my home, trying to sort out which ingredients would work well with each other. And I knew there was a, the potential using growth factors. There are peptides that we found in our body and that, that certain combination of growth factors could actually work in addition to silicone cream with these other really cool ingredients that, have, that are backed by science. So Skinuba was created primarily because we want, I, I, there was a lack of advancements in skincare. And I really think that skincare needs to push in better research for developing products and cleaner, safer products that we can apply to our skin. There's really not a lot of regulation in that. And so I wanted to have a push of a product line that it helps with scarring. We have a second product now out called Skinuva Bright for melasma, uh, hyperpigmentation using the same branding of growth factors, same technology of growth factors, but backed by science, backed by data to show that these products actually work. So we have five publications now for Skinuva Scar uh, showing its safety and efficacy and that it works and it works better than silicone cream. That's massive. We're so blessed that there's no other product line out there that is backed by data like this. And, and then we have one paper now, thankfully we just got approved for publication for Skinuva Bright. So we're carrying that same trend of developing our second product, but backed by science as a next generation line of skincare products using growth factor technology. So I'm so excited. And that's one of the things I've been working on during the COVID pandemic to really fine tune that product line so we can really develop these products so doctors and patients can really use the, the top line, most advanced skincare that we possibly can buy. Yeah, I use Bright. Um, I actually use the product. So I like bright for under my eyes. Guinea I, pig. I do get, I do get some hyperpigmentation pig. in it, too. I, so I could say it's pretty good. It's a good product. Yeah, thank you. I'm not biased or anything. Yeah, she has to say it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, quick reminder to both of you again, if you can really speak up. We still have people having a hard time hearing you. So right. just with each answer, really try to, to speak loudly so everyone can hear every word, okay? The last thing I said? Say your last sentence again. You talked about hyperpigmentation under your eyes and utilizing yeah, the product. So I have hyperpigmentation under my eyes. So I use Skinuva Bright, and he uses me as a guinea pig. And I will say it's a great product, and I am not um, Not biased. biased. <laughs> she did. She obviously gives me feedback during the development Yeah, process. I'm actually and, the most critical person. And it's great. <laughs> You're like, actually, no, it's too cakey. Let's go back. I don't like the texture of it. Let's go back. And so it's nice having Rhonda on board because she knows all the top skincare products that, she's, that she likes. And I have a high bar to set up with my chemist and my scientists when we develop these products. <laughs> so. Well, that's a great partner. You guys are a great team. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Doctor, or actually... Dr. Kalasho, this is back over to you from a viewer. She wants to know if there's any sort of correlation between autoimmune diseases and having soft teeth. Yeah, actually, there, there are quite a few autoimmune diseases. Even lupus would cause softness of the teeth. Um, and that, that uh, there is also autoimmune diseases that can cause sloughing of gum tissue as well. Um, so what, what does soft teeth mean? Like what, what's you know, so for? I guess soft teeth, um, I would think that a lot of, that's a layman's term for essentially brittle teeth, like teeth that get cavitated easily or get cavities easily or stain easily. Um, break easily, break easily. Uh, you know, they are, and I, a lot of it has to do with what they believe is because of the medications you're on when you are, when you do have an autoimmune disease, usually you have anti-inflammatories or drugs that are combating your immune response, right? Because your body is kind of fighting itself. So if you're, if you're doing that, then what ends up happening is your natural defense system, especially in the mouth, that is trying to fight cavity, that's trying to fight gum disease, is inhibited as well. And so you'll notice more bleeding gums, more irritated tissue, um, essentially more plaque production also in the mouth, and so what ends up happening is I think that my, my take on it is that it's not exactly the autoimmune disease itself uh, that is causing the, the, the gum disease and the brittleness of the, of the teeth. It's, it's essentially all the drugs that they have to take to combat the autoimmune disease that is inhibiting their body's natural response to fighting off a, a bacterial infection in the mouth. Thank you, so, Dr. Kalasha. 
that they should, uh, patients who actually have, uh, are taking a lot of uh, interference, what other medications do they take if they're autoimmune? I mean, there's like, uh, so they, many they, immunological there's medications, so many, like yeah. methotrexate, Humira. That's another Humira, one. Yes. A lot of uh, them, they, they tend to have a lot of bleeding. The, the immediate response is getting really inflamed gums, that even when they press it, sometimes it just bleeds. And it's even spontaneous bleeding. A lot of patients that we have, if they're if they're if they're speaking, they'll notice that sometimes blood starts to come down, and that's a really advanced case. Um, generally, those patients haven't seen a dentist. So if you are a, a, a auto, if you have an if you're immune compromised, or if you have an autoimmune disease, you still want to see a dentist. You're more inclined to getting fungal infection in your mouth, bacterial infection in your mouth. Uh, gum disease and cavities. So your so your dentist should be your best friend, and of course, using the right products for home. Um, I also find that the water pick is really good for those patients that have that excessive bleeding gums. You'll even find it if you're taking birth control, or if you're taking any type of, uh, or even during that time of the month, hormones can even have the same effect. Um, using a water pick is really helpful to make sure that the gums stay nice and healthy and, and keep that resiliency. Thank you, Dr. Kalasho. Dr. Zumala, from a, and remember to speak up from an audience member. They want to know what are, what are your thoughts on preventative Botox? Preventative Botox. Uh, yeah, it's good. It's she's, great. She, someone's been bothering me a lot about that the last yeah. few months. Uh, Look, see, you can see if I I'm mean, mad. I'm, you, know, you, you have to kind of find the right doctor that fits well for your uh, desires. Every doctor has their own belief of Botox. I, I like to treat people uh, for Botox when they actually have wrinkles that are present uh, and that are bothersome. You know, I'm not one that pushes for heavy amounts of prophylactic Botox. If they come in and, and the patient tells me, I want you to Botox me and I'll, I'll essentially evaluate everybody the same way. Okay, show me your frown lines, <laughs> the 11th, okay. Show me your forehead wrinkles. Clearly, I need some Botox because I have very prominent frontalis muscles, very prominent glabellar folds. Is it because I make you mad? Absolutely. Yes, it's all from <laughs> Dr. Rhonda. Crow's feet here and here. So I would be a very good candidate for Botox because these wrinkles are present. Now, if I have a very young patient, you know, it's not about age, but more likely in a younger age, that comes in and asks me to get Botox. So when I have him or her frown, there's no visible muscles. I'm not going to Botox them. That's my belief. You know, I will treat them when I see these active wrinkles and it are bothersome to them and that I feel there's a justification. And uh, every patient has a different amount of Botox that they receive. So the treatment of Botox, it's again, it's a neuromodulator and you're injecting into the muscle with numbing cream. So it's a fairly painless process. We do it very painless, uh, painlessly with the numbing cream, with a distraction device. What we usually have a vibrating device currently and it really helps uh, distract patients. You'll see it on my, some of my Instagram videos. And ultimately it's, for instance, here, there's the head of the muscle and the tail. Those are two points where the Botox go in at the head of it and the tail to prevent that muscle from going in this way. And it'll last for anywhere from three to four months and it kicks in after a few days and it's quite effective, so. Next time we should do, we should use me. <laughs> Always back to her when it comes to Botox. I like the or, lit, like the eyebrow but, lift. Well, look, so Rhonda doesn't have a lot of wrinkles, right? So if she's asked, basically telling me, <laughs> you need to load me up on Botox. I would take a step back and put my doctor hat on and say, actually, you'll benefit from a very small amount because you don't have a lot of visible wrinkles. Sorry, but that's how it is. Uh, <laughs> I do have one. <laughs> look at this one. Minimal, minimal. So, so. So you, you can do some there, but a very minimal amount because the amount of activity is minimal. You know where I'm going on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Simal and, and Kalasha for the interjection too. Dr. Kalasha, this question is for you. What can someone do to help teeth grinding due to stress? Oh my God. I, I grind. Yeah, so do I. We're not even the, not even the good grinding, not the one that, that does yeah. well in clubs. Yeah. We are we are grinders. Like it sounds like he's eating while he sleeps. Um, so especially now during the pandemic, a lot of people are under a lot of stress. I mean, it's a time of our lives that none of us have ever found ourselves in, and there's so much uncertainty. Uh, I would I'm seeing a lot more of my grinding patients being ever more aggressive with their with with grinding. A couple things 
that you should know is that a lot of it is done when you are not conscious. So while you're asleep, or even maybe when you're kind of just sitting at work on your computer and are doing something that's stressful or, or you're thinking and you're not really knowing where, where you're kind of all that autopilot kind of thing. And you find yourself clenching, which is clenching is like when you're tightening your teeth together. Just imagine biting down and then biting down just enough where you start to see the side muscle kind of come up. That's clenching. Grinding is the process of sliding back and forth. Generally, you'll see a difference in a patient's, uh, how do you know if you're a grinder or how do you know if you're a clencher? Uh, there's telltale signs and all you need to do is you look at your teeth to map that out. So if you're a grinder, your canines, which are the sharp teeth right there, um, if you're a grinder, as you're sliding, you use your canines as a guidance point. So if you keep sliding, you're going you're gonna to wear down your canine tip and it's going to be flat. So if your canines are flat and sometimes you wake up in the morning and you're a little, your jaw's a little sore, or even when you yawn or open your mouth, it kind of gets a little sore, you might be a grinder. If you are a clencher, what you'll notice is that this muscle right here, which is the masseteric, it slings around the lower end of the jaw and it allows your jaw to come up. That guy will become hypertrophic or thick. And then you'll have a thickened appearance of the jaw. You can even palpate it by putting your fingers right down below the, the angle of your, your jaw, and then right down, right, when biting. Yeah, see, like it kind of, and yeah. you can actually put your finger on it and clench, and if your finger kind of bounces off, then you might be a clencher, because that's a lot of, I see you, are you doing it? I see yeah. you doing it. So. <laughs> am, I, am I a grinder? Or, uh, let me look and see if I'm a grinder. Yeah, or a you're grinder. definitely a grinder. You're everything. Yeah. Blind, yeah. Grinder, clencher, yeah. you're every. Okay, so. So you, what, uh, what he does and what I do is we wear night guards, okay? So when we're asleep, especially when we have no cognitive ability to stop ourselves from doing something we're not supposed to, so you're not supposed to be clenching, you're not supposed to be grinding. Um, during REM, when you're fast asleep, all your muscles are kind of spasming and you can cause a lot of wear and, and damage to your teeth. A night guard is going to help. The way a night guard works is it has a, a separation, it allows for separation of your teeth in a position that feels comfortable to the muscles. So what we do is when we take our impressions for patients who are grinders, we use a 3D uh, digital scanning device. That device scans your teeth, takes a thousand pictures a second, okay? And it, it, it puts it onto a computer. And then what we do is capture your bite. Then we open that bite to where your jaw is at rest. And how you know when your jaw is at rest is you lick your lips, just let your mouth drop. That position of where you're, you're, you're just where, allowing your, your jaw to fall where it wants to is your rest position. In that position, none of those muscles are in active uh, states where they're not clenched, they're not being utilized, they're just relaxed. So that night guard is gonna keep your mouth in that position. Um, now, it, the first couple nights, you want to throw it across the room. The dog might find it and might start breaking, or you might want to just throw it away. But I promise you, we're humans and we're creatures of habit. After three nights of wearing it, you will sleep. You'll be Botox? just fine. How about Botox? What's your, when do you start recommending people to get Botox to the masseters? Our dog is over here. He's just running back. <laughs> Uh, both talks to the masseters are, are incredible. Um, I actually sent some patients out to my husband to do that. Uh, they, I like it in combination with a night guard, and I, I recommend it for patients who wear a night guard, and you can see in their night guard, if you, if you were to flip it over, their night guard looks worn because they're still clenching. Okay. So they might not be grinding as much, but their night guard is, has these bite marks all over it. In that case, uh, they really will benefit from getting Botox. What that'll do is relax those muscles that we were talking about. Uh, you can put it in the temporalis. You can put a little bit in buccinator, but mostly it's in the masseteric, and it works. Chris gets it done. I get it done. I really like it. I mean, it doesn't affect you um, when you are when, when you're eating or anything like that, it's actually a great procedure to be well, to be done. If you do too much of yeah, it. Yeah, if you do too much, you can yeah. be like kind of right. wobbly job. But like right. you wanna you wanna go to somebody who knows what they're doing. 
Yeah. So you don't want to be like, oh, you, know, you can't even like eat anything. But, but um, it's a big muscle. It has a, yeah, a lot of giveaway. A really off, nice so. thing is that for females, especially some females have this like square jaw, but they want it to look a yeah. little bit more like nap, like uh, delicate and more um, like pulled in. It, it, you'll notice that the squareness of the jaw comes from active masseteric. So when you do it often, you get a skinnier face. So it gives you a really nice, like soft feature to your face as well. Yeah, it reduces the the width of the jawline because yeah. that prominent muscle. And there's some patients, my gosh, you can yeah. bite, you'll see a it looks literal like, it's like square. golf ball that comes out. Yeah, and it can thin out the the jawline, the width of the reduce the width of the jawline at the same time. It's it, it's it's a very powerful uh, procedure that I, I love doing. It's, I love it's it. Like, it's life changing. It's life changing. It really is. And you, I, I imagine it waking up with pain every day. Yeah, it, it makes. Yeah, it really makes a big difference yeah. for me. Just waking up not having pain. But you have to do it with a night guard. I think that's the thing people don't realize. You need to consider both in situations where it's persistent, despite the use of a night guard. And if you're getting Botox through your masseters, you should consider getting a night guard because yeah, because it could help you. I mean, you'll feel better. Um, yeah. With your facially. Right. But yeah. it, you're still wearing down your teeth. Mm -hmm. So the night guard is protecting the teeth. Exactly. Thank you both, Dr. Kalasha, Dr. Zumalan. Dr. Zumalan, this one is for you. Are there any treatments for under eye hollowing for prevention other than fillers? Uh, that, that, can, that can go, it's a, it's a great question. And remember to speak up. Both of you, so we can hear each that's of you. Great, Thank you. That's a great question. Other <laughs> options. You know, right now, there's a myriad of potential options for people that want to rejuvenate their eyes. And when it comes to volume loss, that results in hollowing. And certainly, some sort of material to improve that volume loss is indicated in those situations. And the most common type is a hyaluronic acid filler, an injection that's done in the office. It's reversible. It's safe when it's done in the hands of an expert. Uh, it can be done in the office and the results are immediate. And the reversible is key. If there's a complication or not, a, more not it's complications are pretty unusual, but if it's an undesirable result, let's say it doesn't look as good as you expected, the procedure can be, the, the, the filler can be dissolved with an enzyme. So it goes away. However, there are uh, other options such as fat, fat grafting, which is taken uh, from somewhere else from the body, usually the, the, the tummy, okay? And also sometimes the inner thighs if somebody really doesn't have a lot of fat in their abdomen. And that fat can be harvested. It can be done in the office or it can be in the operating room in combination with another procedure. And I personally don't uh, perform that fat, uh, fat grafting to patients of just pure hollowing in a first time scenario. I feel that I'm I feel more comfortable with reversible injectables, but fat grafting is an option. There's a lot of physicians or some that are experts in just doing that, uh, but it, it is an option. But there's really no other devices out there that can supplement or treatments or instruments or that can supplement the results that a filler can do when it comes to under eye fillers at this time. Lasers don't help, Botox doesn't help, uh, microneedling doesn't help, thread lips don't help. I mean, these are things that there are all out there and floating around, but they don't. Thank you, Dr. Zumalan. Dr. Kalasho, this is from a viewer. She wants to know if there's any proven evidence that coconut pulling and activated charcoal works. What are your thoughts? Yeah, there is no clinical evidence, no scientific backed um, evidence uh, or, or research that states that that actually um, ac activated charcoal is generally used to whiten teeth. Oil pulling is generally used to, it, they say also whitens teeth, but shows no clinical nor sub subjective objective evidence of that happening. Uh, it's mostly to reduce the chances of developing gum disease is through oil pulling. Now, what I personally think is that, or, or even through science, uh, science literature as well, is that there is no backing towards any one of these using activated charcoal or oil pulling. However, there are a lot of cultures that use oil pulling as a, as a means of getting rid of bacterial contents in the mouth that are associated with gum disease. Oil pulling. Um, oil pulling is like using straight like coconut oil and rinsing it in your mouth. 
Um, and then what you're thinking of, what you're trying to do is lice essentially break up the bacterial cell. Okay, so that in an environment that's, that is it's essentially an, an oily environment, the bacteria doesn't exist well in it and it'll, it'll explode, right? Um, so it won't, it won't exist well. The problem is, is that the type of bacteria that's in gum disease is really underneath the gum tissue. It's underneath, it's, it's actually pretty deep in your gum sulcus. Like it's, it's in your pockets of your gum. So if you, you really can't get oil that, that far in there. So for it to have its effect, it's, it's really minimal. It's thick, oil is thick. So it's really not gonna go into, into the deep crevices in which that bacteria that causes the gum disease exists. Um, some people swear by it. It doesn't really cause damage, however. So if you do use it, you use it intermittently, you think it works. I actually think I'm, I'm a little bit softer uh, when it comes to oil pulling as opposed to activated charcoal. I have used activated charcoal and I use it only in that sometimes I notice that if maybe I have those hard interproximal stains, those like darkened interproximal stains of the, from the coffee, in between stains in between my teeth, uh, using an activated charcoal with my with my electronic toothbrush actually looks like it it kind of debrides a little bit of the so I subjectively think that activated charcoal works in some on some level. Like uh, to extract and make the teeth whiter is that what? It's yeah, supposed it, to it do? kind of destains the teeth a little bit. And there are a lot of studies that show that it it's like baking soda. It does actually make the teeth appear a little whiter. The problem between uh, with what I have with activated charcoal is it cannot be used as your regular toothpaste. One, it doesn't have fluoride in it, and it's pretty abrasive. And I actually don't, I, I don't think that you should be using it more than like once a month, you know, if that, if that. So there are some people who like use it all the time. Their sink's all brown and black, and it looks like you just tarred all these like, it's everywhere. It's, it's a mess. Um, so its benefits really... Are, are minimal. And so, I mean, I, I have used it because my patients always tell me about it. And I like to use products that people always bring up, even though I've done the research on it. I just want to know what my patients are using, how they're using it. Does it work? So I kind of use it on myself. Activated charcoal, I noticed that it does minimal in terms of whitening your teeth. So do the studies. Um, and it is kind of abrasive. So I'm, I'm not a fan of it, but I know my patients use it. Um, if you're using it like sparingly, then I'm okay with you using it. But um, I actually, if you want my suggestion on what to use, baking soda is a little bit better. Uh, baking soda is not as abrasive. We have, we, we rate uh, um, products based on their abrasiveness because the enamel is made of, of essentially that crystalline structure I talked to you guys about earlier. So if you're using a toothpaste that is really abrasive, like a hard, like almost little tiny rocks, right? You're going to be uh, causing little micro fractures in your enamel. You don't want that. You're only blessed with the, what you have. You can't really get back the enamel that you lost. So what I want instead is I, I, I want a product that has really low, uh, something called RDA, which is it's, it's a scale of abrasiveness. Um, generally, Sensodyne whitening products, like the Sensodyne toothpaste, uh, toothpaste has really low uh, RDA, which is, which is how abrasive it is. A lot of the Crest products as well. But baking soda is by far one of the lowest. So if you want to use baking soda, you can use that. But baking soda doesn't usually have fluoride. All of your products, any, any type of toothpaste, mouth rinse that you use should have fluoride. Because our teeth are made of something called hydroxyapatite, which is essentially a crystalline structure. And if you remember from basic chemistry, fluoride is a negatively charged ion that can sit in that crystalline structure. And that actually will form something called hydroxyfluoroapatite, which is, is essentially a very strong crystalline structure that protects the enamel and really minimizes the chance that you will develop cavities. So making sure that any product you use has fluoride in it will be good with me. Thank you, Dr. Kalasha. Of course. Dropping some chemistry. Good. Dr. Simone, this is going to be our <laughs> I read. <laughs> this is going to be our final question over to you. What trends are you seeing right now with procedures that patients are requesting? There's always trends that are coming and going in plastic surgery and you know, And remember to speak up. 
there's, there's a lot of trends that we see in plastic surgery. And as a, as, a, as, a, as a provider, you have to figure out which one works best for your practice and which is safe and effective and is backed by clinical trials and that you're comfortable providing. So I'm one uh, that believes in using tried and true tested uh, procedures for my patients. So with that being said, uh, the trends that we're seeing right now are non-surgical trends. There's always a trend for people to not have surgery. How can we avoid surgery? And in my particular field, it's patients that uh, come in with under eye bags and wish to have them treated without surgery. And so that's where fillers can come and be of help, but they can also be of a problem. Uh, so a lot of people that I see uh, with that should be surgery candidates, although they're trying to avoid surgery, non-surgical treatments can actually create more problems. And then you have to end up figuring out how to dissolve the filler. And then sometimes the swelling still persists despite having the filler dissolved. It's opening a can of worms in these situations and the patients get really bummed out. So that, you know, the trends do come and go. Fillers are very solid. I use them in my practice for the right patient. But when you're trying to avoid what really needs to be done in some patients, you can create problems. Uh, thread lifts are uh, performed as well as a way to help lift up some of the jowls in patients or the cheek. I don't perform thread lifts. A lot of my colleagues do. They love them. It's just not something that I do in my practice at this time, but that's a trend that was present 20 or 30 years ago, and it's been kind of refined now, and more and more people are doing it. Again, it's not permanent. It's temporary. You know, you just have to decide that you're, that if, when you're going to do it, to do it with somebody that does a lot of these procedures, that has a reputation, that's board certified, and that you trust that person. That's ultimately what it comes down to as more and more devices come around. Find that doctor that does it, does a lot of it, has great reviews, and is board certified. Those are really important because you're going to somebody that has a reputation, somebody that speaks about it, somebody that publishes about it. You know, in my field, I see a lot of trends, but what I believe in still is surgery for the patients that have excess skin in their upper eyelids. It's a safe procedure, minimal downtime. It's done by an expert like myself. Uh, lower lid surgery as well, that natural looking blepharoplasty that we talked about. You know, we've refined that technique to do it in a minimally invasive fashion. Patients have a, a, a fairly easy recovery and it's addressing the problem. So as trends come and as they may leave, but if they stay, make sure you as a consumer, you do your research and not just base it on what you see on Instagram that the person, the doctor or provider is doing it, make sure that doctor is vetted, do your research, go outside the social media platform and make sure that this is the right doctor for you with these accolades that they have in addition to having the, the, the large number of followers. There's more to it than that. So, you know, the consumer has to do their homework before they end up doing these procedures. And I think that that's a strong takeaway message that I always want to give to my patients. So, you Thank think? you, Dr. Zimalan. Welcome. So the thread lift, how long does it last? Well, it depends on, oh God, here we go. <laughs> okay. That's a serious uh, question. I mean, it depends on which one you use. There's, there's a few different ones and some of them dissolve quicker than others. Some dissolve. In, so can you dissolve like uh, I, asymmetrically? I, like I, one side goes down to the other side? You know, the problem with thread lifts is that they, they temporarily look good, but the longevity can be a question and I'm not one that would use it for addressing asymmetry. I would, you know, use it for the right patient if I were to do it uh, in combination with fillers. Mm -hmm. That can really give you a good result. But by itself, may not be ideal. Is it in office? Yeah, it's done in the office. Okay. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always, right. always trying to look for more. Dr. Galasho, final question to you. Final question. Final. All right, we're ready. Why, we're having fun. <laughs> so, and remember to speak up. So this is from a viewer. They were told they have three wisdom teeth that were need to, they need to be removed or pulled. They don't bother the viewer. Is it absolutely necessary to have them removed? That's an amazing question. Great question. Okay, so if somebody, is, uh, somebody has wisdom teeth uh, still and they're you know, past age 16, uh, a lot of the times they are in a position where it's not favorable for you to actually be able to clean them. 
So they might be out and they're not bothering you, but I would say they're not bothering you yet. Because but they of, will. They will. A lot of the times that those teeth that are that are back there are really hard to clean. And then you get gum tissue that kind of grows over the over that tooth or it's so far back there that you get some pocketing around the gum tissue where you essentially have beautiful immaculate gums and, and, and health throughout your mouth, but all the way in those wisdom teeth, you have big pockets, um, a lot of plaque, maybe even a bad smell that comes out of there. It's just so far back there that you can't really clean it. So a lot of the times when we, when we suggest to patients that they should have them remo removed, it's if they're, it, it looks as though the patient can't take care of them. Because ultimately, what will happen is like a domino effect. If one tooth is not doing so hot, I mean, they all share such a small space. The tooth next to it could become, it's like a rotten apple next to a healthy one. So it starts to rot too. So what will end up, end up happening is you might get like a domino effect of gum disease all because of that wisdom tooth that you're not even using. So people don't even use wisdom teeth, which is unfortunate. I wasn't born with two of them. I wasn't but, born with one of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're evolutionary yes, I know. Advanced. I mean, we're evolutionarily advanced. No, I'm just kidding. So, so I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> some people are not born with any of them. They're so lucky. I think it's like 25%. I wasn't born with them either. I was always grateful. Yeah, we hate people well, like you. No, no. I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> so, so tell us, is it a, the, 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 the process that patients undergo in your practice? Yeah, so. Uh, what, is, what kind of experience do you so, have? Just to back up for a second before you go through that. So the bottom line is, yes, get them removed. Because yeah, you'll be dealing with issues with the domino effect. suggested it, especially. If, so if, if, if you see it out and you don't have pocketing or and you're using it to chew, some people can have their wisdom teeth and be fine. They keep them. But I mean, if it shows any signs of it being like slanted a little bit or coming off at an odd angle, or maybe one of them's not out and the other one is, and as that one, since that one's not out, the one on top is starting to come down. And then you're going to get essentially something called super eruption, which is a tooth trying to leave your body. It's, it's an interesting the things thing. Things you don't want to be dealing with. No, just take them out. Like if they, if you, if you can take them out, take them out and you don't need to be put to sleep for them. A lot of the times I would say 90 and we, nine, and we do so many wisdom teeth extractions. I did a, one this morning. Um, so I, I would say 99% of our patients are not asleep. They're just, they just get a uh, local anesthetic. And I have a colleague that, that will put them to sleep if they need to be. Um, but we really just, we baby our patients. We spend all the time making sure they're comfortable, they're numb, they don't feel a thing, and we just take those suckers right out. <laughs> take those suckers right out. Yeah. Well, there are so many questions that people have written in that we were not able to get to in our hour. We're a little bit over. What we can do How, is what's the easiest way to reach each of you? Starting with you, Dr. Kalasha. Yeah, you can. I, I love my Instagram messages. I try to get to them um, every day. So if you do have a question, go to my Instagram. It's just at Dr. Dr. Rhonda, R H O N D A, Kalasho, K A L A S H O. So it's at Dr. Dot Rhonda Kalasho. Uh, send me a message there and just ask whatever. To, because, you know, you can send me some, uh, some photos. Be it appropriate. Yeah, be appropriate. Okay, but. <laughs> my husband's going to walk. My husband, I'm just kidding. So just send me pictures if you want to, if you want me to see um, anything, or if you have any questions, I'll be happy to oblige and answer anything that you guys need. Um, so Instagram is actually a great way well, to get to me. We can do is also April is uh, if you could email us the questions that we didn't. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we could can do, do uh, a response from our stories, and yeah. we can send that out later today. And that way we can do it uh, before the end of the day so we can get those responses out. Dr. Zimon, speak up so we can all hear you. Uh, and also send, give your so, Instagram handle. Yeah, just send us, April, when you have a moment, just send us the questions that we didn't answer and we'll respond to them from our stories. Perfect. And the people can uh, see them. Yep. Or they can DM us and our office staff or ourselves will get back to them. But we can just post them on our stories that way. Yeah, let us know. We, I'll answer anything. Yeah, Perfect. It's fine. And Dr. Zuman, go through your Instagram handle so everyone can hear. Uh, Dr. Christopher Zumalin. So it's my full name. And if you type in Zumalin, Z O U M A L A N, 
I'll be right there looking at you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you both for your time today. And this is extremely informative. That yeah, was fun. It was really fun. Yeah, Thank fun. you. And I uh, hope everything's uh, well out for you. You're in Miami, correct? I'm actually working from a home office in Destin, Florida. Destin, Florida. Oh, well, I love Florida. Well, be safe. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be connecting soon live down the road. Uh, thank you both for your partnership and, and support of Hope Beauty and Hope Living. And thank wishing you. you to stay healthy and safe. Thank yeah, you so much. You're welcome. Thank stay you. Healthy. All right. Bye now. Bye. Bye.